so great to see everybody off this morning. And I uh, want to welcome everyone here. Not sure if we have any visitors um, here today with us in, uh, in the building. Um, but if you are visiting and I just don't recognize it, we're glad you're here. But also want to say a special um, welcome to any visitors we might have with us uh, online, watching online. And, and again, we're just so thankful uh, that you have chosen to spend your time uh, with us this morning, worshiping with us, and we would love to be able to get to know you better. So um, please uh, take advantage of, if you're watching online, go to our website and um, and go to the contact and, and send us an email. Let us know who you are and, and, and we'd love to be able to get back in touch with you. I have a, a few announcements. Uh, if you were watching, this is going to be mostly what you've seen on, uh, on the board, but uh, just look as some reminders. Uh, our life groups are, are, are going, our virtual life groups, and, and one uh, virtual life groups, two on Friday night, one on Sunday night. And uh, we also have a, one meeting here on Thursday afternoons. Uh, and just encourage everyone who's not involved in a life group, uh, that is a great way for us to keep our, uh, you know, to keep in touch with each other and keep community going and, and to stay in the Word together. So. Um, you can go online and uh, to our website and it'll point you to how you can uh, sign up for those life groups. Or you can talk to me and I can help you with that. Um, and we also have online prayer meetings, uh, two of them uh, on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. Uh, one, one the Massies are hosting and the other one the Candies are hosting. And so I encourage you to, to get hooked up with, with either of those two as well. Um, Last week we showed a video about right, our Right Now Media um, and just want to encourage everybody, if you haven't yet, to, uh, to take advantage of that. It's a great resource. Uh, one thing that I would say is that we get a discount if we get 50% of the people to sign up. And so even if one person in your household is signed up, the other can sign up. And it's actually useful for you both to have your own profiles. It's similar to email. You have your own email. Uh, if you have your own profile, you can customize things the way you want. So I would encourage families, for you know, both the adults, to, to actually sign up for that. And again, it can help us in the end if we get 50% uh, usage. There's a food pantry this coming Saturday. And uh, we're thankful that we're able to continue to operate and uh, serve our community. Uh, we have a time of packing on uh, Friday afternoons from about 2.30 to 5.00. If uh, there's somebody who want, would like to uh, come and help with that, uh, and one of the things we, we're trying to be careful about is that uh, folks that are in vulnerable categories, you know, don't feel like, uh, I know there are lots who want to volunteer, but don't feel like you need to come out and put yourself at risk in order to that because we, we have been able to operate. Uh, but but any, anybody else who uh, would like to help, we'd love to have you. And, and Saturdays and distribution as well, uh, from 8 to 11. So talk to me if you'd like to volunteer for that. And uh, just a reminder, uh, we usually have our the, the care net baby bottle drive that goes on where people take the bottles home and, uh, and fill them up with their, their change and bring them back. Well, because of uh, you know, the pandemic, we're not able to, to do it in that way, but the, the, they're still doing that, uh, that drive and it's all online. So. I would encourage everyone, you know, if that if if, uh, if life matters to you uh, for the unborn, that you might consider uh, going on and, and donating to that. And when you do donate, you can uh, donate in, in honor of Highland Baptist Church, and they'll know that it's coming from us. And then finally, we have a come together meeting um, following the service on the 28th uh, of this month. So I encourage everybody, and that's after, yes, after service. So I encourage everybody uh, to make an effort to, to be there for that as well. Thank you. All right, if you would please stand for the call of worship this morning. I apologize for the scripture up on the screen for us this morning. It's going to be right in my Bible. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, I'm going to read verse 9 
2.17 this morning. Starting in verse 9. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to them, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. What a great hope this morning, and a great promise to us, that no matter how this life goes, we have something that we can look forward to. One day, those of us who place our faith in Jesus Christ will worship God forever and eternity, and we'll never get tired of it, we'll never get bored, we'll never get sad. Any tear that shed here on earth will be wiped from our eyes. When I can remember what happened here on earth, the things and tribulations that we went through. And notice how within this group there's people from all over the world. Every ethnicity, every language, everybody is going to be part of this. The gospel is going to reach the entire world. It's a promise. Guys, this morning, as we come to worship, I'm sure you all have seen there's been so many protests going on lately in every city, including Fitchburg. I had the privilege of being there myself to support our brothers and sisters who, who feel as though they are not being treated fairly. There's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of healing that needs to be done in our city of Fitchburg. So it's a privilege to be there, to stand alongside them. I didn't get to talk to people like I wanted to. It was good just to be there to say, hey, I'm standing next to you, I support you. And it's just a reminder to us that everything that's going on in this world is simply a byproduct of God not being in our society anymore. And us as the church, that's why it's so important for us to go and reach the lost. That's why there's so many bad things going on in this world, because it is devoid of Christ and love and the gospel. We have, we have the answers for every one of life's problems this morning. So we have a great opportunity here at Highland Baptist Church to reach Fitchburg. There's so many people who are, again, hurting, who need healing, who need answers, who don't have the same hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So let's just be thankful that we have this body that we can worship, the hope that we have, but let's make sure we go out and spread that to those in our city. Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity and privilege to be here to gather in this building, to hear your word, to worship you corporately. Thank you, Father, for this passage that we just read that gives us so much inspiration and hope. Lord, that this life here on earth is not our best life, that our best life is yet to come, and one day we'll be with you in all of eternity. And everything that's happened here on earth will fade away. Lord, thank you that you're going to wipe the tears from our eyes. Father, we pray for those in our city of Fitchburg and, and all over all over this country, Lord. I want to specifically pray for Fitchburg because that's where we're at right now. Lord, I just pray that you would do a great work using not just our church, but all the churches in Fitchburg and the surrounding areas to bring the gospel to those who are hurting, who need healing. Lord, who are just feeling like they are being let down by our justice system. Lord, and I pray that we would stand alongside of our brothers, that we would have the confidence to do that, to put arms around them, to love them. But ultimately, Lord, we understand that our world needs the 
the love of Jesus Christ. That things are not going to change until hearts are changed. And only you and the Holy Spirit, only you can change our hearts, Lord. I pray that our desire will be, Lord, to go out and be a part of that. We have your privilege. We thank you for this morning. We pray that you do a great work in us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Please be seated. Again, no singing. I know it's, uh, it's such a wonderful part of our worship together, and the Lord you know, calls us to sing, and so we want to get back to that. Uh, but until then, I uh, have another reading of a, of a hymn, and uh, a little context to this. Uh, our um, our message today is coming from Paul's second missionary journey. And uh, when Paul and Silas were in Philippi, uh, without going into a lot of details, they found themselves um, at odds with, uh, with the people there trying to ca cause trouble. To, um, and, um, and they rose up against them, and they were beaten, um, and they were put in jail. And if you remember, they were in jail, and at, at, at night they, um, they were praying and singing, and something amazing happened. And that's what this, um, this hymn is about. Night had fallen on the city, and the streets at last were still, where the noisy throng the day long did the air with shoutings fill. And the weary, wayworn travelers preaching Jesus through the land were in deepest dungeon darkness at the magistrate's command. Many stripes to them were given, many curses on them cast, many bolts and bars surround them, in the stocks their feet were fast. While the trusty Roman jailer, all securely slumbering on, little dreamed the, the mighty wonder of the morrow's early dawn. Hark the sighing of the prisoners, hear their moanings loud and long, no, again, and louder, clearer, tis the voice of prayer and song. See, the prison walls are shaking, and the door wide open stands. Lo, the earth, the earth is quaking, loosed are every prisoner's bands. Oh, there's not a cell so lonely, but a song may echo there. Oh, there's not a night so cheerless, but there's potency in prayer. Sing, O oh, sing, thou weary pilgrim, song will bring thee heavenly peace. Pray, O oh pray, thou burdened prisoner. God will give thee sweet release. Uh, it's a beautiful poem, hymn, that just reminds us that no matter what we are facing, no matter what trials and tribulations, that first of all, we, we are called to, to remain joyful in the Lord. And um, instead of, you know, Paul and Silas being weary and, and, uh, and, and moaning like the other prisoners, they were joyful, and they were singing, and they were praying, and God delivered them. And uh, sometimes it happens quickly, sometimes it takes a long time, maybe sometimes it doesn't happen at all, but we're still called to be joyful, and there's nothing that we face as individuals or as the church, um, no, no tribulations, no obstacles, that our, our God isn't powerful enough to overcome, so we should always keep hope in Him. Could you please uh, join me in prayer before we dive into the Word? Father, we thank You for this day, for this opportunity to come together, for this, uh, for this time that You have given to us, and the various means that you've made available for us to, to still come together and, and read your word, whether it is in person or virtual, Father, that you would move in this time, that you would speak to us through your word, and that through us you would speak into the communities where we live. You are, Father, the, the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Life, and that through us in our communities, Father, that you would move and make a change, that you would bring justice and bring peace 
to all that are hurting and point to yourself that it all be for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as he said, we're going to be in Acts, uh, we're going to be in the second missionary journey, which begins in the end of Acts. Um, and while you're turning there, I'm going to give you uh, a little bit of an idea of what we're going to be talking about and a little bit of context. So uh, I used to get into a lot of fights when I was younger, and in high school, my brother ended up getting into a fight with a friend of his over something that had been said about our mom. And the thing to remember is that my brother was a small, agile boxer. That was how he was trained to fight. That was what he was good at. And his friend was a much larger person. He was very slow, and he was a wrestler. And so my dad gave my brother some advice. He said, don't let him get you into any small places, and whatever you do, don't let him grab you. Because if he gets a hold of you, it's over. So I went with my brother just in case uh, the other guy brought back up, which it turns out he did. Uh, he brought three other kids. And so my brother came with this plan, right? He's going to show up. He's going to not get into a tight spot. He's going to not get grabbed. He's going to just dodge around and punch a lot until uh, his friend gives in. But they were concerned about cops showing up, and so they agreed to go into the woods, which means that my brother's plan got ruined right off the bat. Now, I came with a plan, and my plan was just I was going to stand around and watch. But then when the other three guys decided to jump in, my plan got disrupted. I had to stop them from getting involved. Their plan was to jump in and beat up my brother altogether, and that got resolved when one of them got thrown against a tree, and the other ones decided they didn't want to be involved in this anymore. And the other guy came with a plan that he was going to just sit there wailing on my brother until he gave in, and that got disrupted when I said, okay, you won. That's been enough. When he didn't listen, he also got thrown against a tree. And it's really easy to make plans and think that you're pretty clever when you come up with a plan and it lasts, you know, right up until you get wood in your face. Because plans that we make on our own are easy to mess up. We have a limited understanding of the circumstances that we're walking into. We have a limited resources to handle changing situations. We have limited perspective to know what the course forward is even going to look like. And we have limited ability to do the best thing in every situation. Right? Every single person in that situation, and, and in every situation that arises really, finds that things aren't always what they plan on them being, and plans get disrupted. And that's a bit of what we're going to be talking about this morning. Um, and we've been talking a lot about how the church is unstoppable. That's, it's actually in the sermon series title, right? The sermon series is Empowered and Unstoppable. That's what we've been talking about a lot. But one of the things that we really see highlighted in Paul's second missionary journey is that it wasn't Paul that was unstoppable. And it wasn't Paul's plans that were unstoppable. See, because we're not saying in this series that we can just decide what we want to do and the Holy Spirit will make it happen, Right? There's a lot of things individually that we can learn from this journey, but we're going to be focusing on the big picture of the whole journey, and that big picture is that God's plan is the thing that is unstoppable. All right, so real quick context. Like I said, we're going to be in the end. Uh, the second missionary journey starts at the end of uh, Acts 15. actually starts in verse 36. You notice there's a whole lot of verse 15 before that. Um, so... Last week, we talked about the first missionary journey, and what had happened was uh, a lot of Gentiles became Christians during that first missionary journey that uh, Johnny explained to us last week. In the midst of this, with this huge influx of Gentile believers, there was this rising question of how Jewish do they have to become to be Christian? And uh, if you follow my blog, which, which I, I think maybe one of you does, uh, you've already heard me th talk about this a little bit, but what happened at the Jerusalem Council was that they determined you don't have to become Jewish to become Christian, all right? And so once they had resolved that, Paul and Barnabas decide that they want to go spread the word about the results of the, of the, um, of the council. So they come up with this plan. Acts 15.36 is kind of the mission statement of the second missionary journey. It is in response to the Jerusalem Council that happened because of the first missionary journey. So Acts 15.36, mission statement of the second missionary journey says, And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, 
let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. All right, so it's a simple plan. Let's go check on those churches that we planted. Let's go let them know how things are going, fill them in, see how things are, if there's anything we can do to help them out. But that didn't last very long. All right. In fact, almost immediately, things start to fall apart. All right. There's going to be four major, major points in this sermon. All right. The first of those is that the team changed. The team changed. Acts 15, starting in verse 36 through 41, right? So I just read 36, and then after that, what happens is, starting in 37, now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So the last journey started out as Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark, but John Mark ditched them pretty early on. In fact, what happened was they went from Antioch to Cyprus, and then as soon as they landed on the mainland again, Mark was out, went back to Jerusalem. So who's going this time? Because the churches that Paul wants to visit, only Paul and Barnabas were at last time. So in Paul's mind, it's going to be Paul and Barnabas. The A-team, we're getting the team back together, we're going out and we're doing this. But Barnabas is thinking, no, we set out with John Mark last time, let's set out with John Mark this time. You ever, you ever have that happen? Been that awkward third person? Right? I, I have. When my brother was dating this one girl that lived a half hour away, he wasn't able to drive yet, so I had to drive him on their first date. And you should have seen the look on her face. Right? Oh, you're here too. Right? I, I told her, I said, I promise no one here likes it more than you do. But it's awkward when there's that one person in the group that at least one other person doesn't want to be in that group. And so they had some of this tension happening with Paul not wanting to bring John Mark, and it ends up being that they split up. And Paul and Silas go one way, they go by land, north, and Barnabas takes Mark and continues on the original plan. So they're already off to a bad start. The plan has already been broken. The team is broken up. But God still has work to do. So, as Paul's going along, he starts picking up other people as well. Picks up Timothy and Lystra. He ends up picking up Luke. We, uh, we never are actually told specifically, and this is where Paul met Luke, but uh, there's one verse, Acts 16.10, where, where Luke, the author of Acts, stops using they to describe the party and starts using we. And so apparently they picked Luke up in Troas. And we don't know whether all of this was that God decided that Paul, uh, Paul and Barnabas needed to be going different ways, and so he was going to split them up, or if he was just using their bad decisions to get his work done. He's capable of either one. But let's be honest, Paul was wrong here. Right? It wasn't that Mark wasn't good for the work. Remember that it was Barnabas' discernment that gave Paul a place in the church to begin with. Barnabas is the person who went to the church in Jerusalem and said, listen, no, Paul is one of us. You need to hear him. You need to talk to him. And that's what gave him an opportunity to become part of the community. When Barnabas arrived in Antioch and realized that there was ministry to be done, he was the one who said, I need to go get Saul out of Tarsus and bring him to Antioch, from which he ends up getting sent on the first missionary journey. So he should have been willing to trust Barnabas, but he didn't. And Paul later ends up taking this back. In, in 2 Timothy 4.11, he describes Mark as being very useful to me for ministry. All right, so we know that Paul wasn't perfect. This wasn't a perfect plan. None of this was his plan, in fact. But God sees to it that even in the midst of that, they have the people they need to, for the work that he has them to do. Because a breaking up of a team like Paul and Barnabas would be the end of most human ventures. But the mission that God was sending them on was something very different than they realized. And this is the second point, that the destination and the goal changed. The destination and the goal changed. In Acts 16.6, we have described them 
walking around. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had to come to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging them and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, not all of us are great with biblical geography, and so um, basically they were wanting to be here, and next thing they know, they're over here. Let's here, uh, this is a massive redirection. Here's, here's an example kind of to help us understand it. Let's say you were doing an outreach ministry. And so you left from Fitchburg, you go down Route 2, you head over, you go to Greenfield, you do some work, it's successful. You go north into Brattleboro, Vermont, head over to R- Keene, do some work, get chased out of Keene, go to Ringe, do some work there, get chased out of Ringe, and then you just backtrack back through Keene, Brattleboro, Greenfield, and back. All right? We all kind of know where those places are. A few years later, though, you decide to go and check up on those places that you went to. And for whatever reason, you go the other way. So you go to Ringe first, and then you go to Keene. And then you realize, you know what, maybe not. Maybe we should check on Bennington. Bennington's just, what, an hour past uh, Brattleboro? It'll be fine, all right? And next thing you know, God has closed every door and blocked every single exit and prevented you from stopping, and you are standing at a rest stop in Syracuse, and this is when God tells you, I want you in Canada. Canada? I packed for Brattleboro. This is the kind of thing that they're talking about here when they suddenly show up in Troas, and God's like, I want you to go over to Europe. Now, they had good reason to think that they knew where they, what they were doing before this point, Right, because they started out plan- going where they were planning to go. They recognized the need for the gospel to be spread, and they wanted to go to the nearby area, which was the region of Asia, which is basically southwestern Turkey today. They wanted to go there, but God intervenes. And because sometimes the work God has for us means turning aside from work that seems like a good idea. Sometimes it means turning away from work that seems like the natural next step, like the logical thing that we should be doing next. And instead, doing something completely different that you would not have imagined, that you would not have thought of, but that nonetheless God has planned for the next step. It can be frustrating, this process, because it involves a lot of closing doors to keep us on track. Right? And I can tell you that's frustrating. I've been there. It killed me to walk away from Greenfield when I was trying to plant a church there. It almost literally killed me. Um, It kills me to know that I probably won't ever minister in my hometown because I love that place and I want to see it. And it must have been horrible for Paul and company to walk past Asia, knowing that there's all these people there who need the gospel that they can't go and talk to, to turn aside from Bithynia, a region that, as far as we know, there had been no gospel presence in at this point and go to Troas. It it had to be horrible for them to do nothing because they didn't know God's plan for Asia. They didn't know that at the end of this missionary journey they were actually going to end up in Asia anyway by way of Ephesus. But they listened and they followed. And because they did that, they got to carry the gospel into Macedonia. And I don't know if we fully recognize normally, how important that fact is. How much of a blessing it has been to the church that they went to Macedonia, especially at the time that they did. All right, consider this. Thirteen books of your Bible were written by Paul. We can confirm. Some people think Hebrews was as well, that would make it 14. We're just going to not dive into that argument right now. Thirteen books in the Bible we can confirm were written by Paul. All right? Eight of those are cities that he directly visited because of this missionary journey. All right? The book of Philippians, first and second Thessalonians, first and second Corinthians. Like I said, he goes back to Ephesus, so that's Ephesians, that's first Timothy, that's second Timothy. That's one of the churches that's mentioned in Revelation. Why does he write Romans? I'll tell you why he writes Romans. Because when he was traveling, 
Jews had been expelled from Rome. And so he runs into some Roman Jewish people in Corinth. He runs into these people, he meets them, he talks to them, and then when they get to go back to Rome, there's some conflict there, and because Paul knows some people there, he writes the book of Romans. Where would the church be today without the book of Romans? Those two people that he meets there in Corinth end up setting Apollos straight. Apollos was at the time, you'll see in in the missionary journey, preaching the gospel according to John the Baptist. They help him understand that this was all talking about Jesus. And so Apollos goes and does amazing work throughout Achaia, which is also in Greece, and the region around around Ephesus, and is someone who ends up working with Paul and Paul talking about at length in in some of his letters. All of this, so much of what we have in the New Testament, so much of what we have, just condensed explanation of what the gospel is and how we live it out, exists only because God said no to Asia and had them go to Macedonia. And they listened. And they didn't know any of that at this time. See, because Paul thought that he was going out to encourage some believers, but God knew that he was going out to change the world. I want us to consider the possibility that if we think we know the fullness of what God is planning to do through our lives or through this church, then we're thinking too small. Now, the path there may be very surprising, and it might mean abandoning things that we think are normal or natural or should be the next step, things that we thought in the past that God was calling us to do. It may even include changing the way that we do things, because this is point three, the method changed. The method changed. Paul had basically one missionary method that we see prior to the second missionary journey. All right? And literally in Acts 17 verse 2, it describes it as this was his custom. All right, now here's what it was. He shows up in a place, he goes to the synagogue, He sits down with the men who are leading the synagogue, and he argues with them until they see Christ in the scriptures. And then some of those people agree with him and become the church, and the rest of them stone him and kick him out. This is his process. He did this in Damascus. He did this in Jerusalem. This is the thing that we see him doing over and over and over again. From day one, the moment the scales fell from his eyes, he had this method in place, and it kept all all the way through until Philippi. Basically, the rest of chapter 16 is them in Philippi. I'm not going to read the whole of chapter 16. I'm just going to summarize it for you. I would very much encourage you to read it through this week. What they find out is that there's no synagogue, so they can't go there and argue. So they go looking for a place where believers are praying. And when they do that, they go to the river. The river is going to be the place where people are gathering, people who love God are gathering He's on his way to the river, and you can just imagine him like walking there, rehearsing his arguments. Okay, they're going to say this. They're going to go. To, here's where I want to go in Isaiah. They're going to. Okay, practicing these arguments on his way down to the river. They show up, and there's no men. As far as we can tell, it's just women at the river praying. There's no Jewish religious leadership in place. There's no habitual practice happening. They're just there praying together. So they present the gospel, and one of those women just signs right up, Lydia. We don't have any argument recorded. So Paul and Silas go back into town, and they're walking around, probably another day, and they get followed by this woman who has a demon in her. And so they cast out the demon, and as Tim Foster pointed out earlier, this is at the point where they get beaten up, they get thrown into jail, they're now in jail, and they just... They don't have, they're not standing before a proconsul. they're not standing before a judge, they don't have the opportunity to have the arguments that Paul is used to having. So what do they do? They, they sing. And in doing that, God uses that to open doors and send someone to them who literally asks them, what do I do to be saved? And so they go through. The rules of engagement for Paul completely changed here. He's used to doing things one way, and if he had insisted on sticking to that, he would have walked right past Philippi and gone to Berea, looking for a synagogue. If he had gone to that river and started arguing with people, 
who are just there praying and looking for a word, instead of sharing the word that he had, he probably would have driven them away. They needed to change their methods because the situation in Philippi was not like it was in the cities that they had been in before. God opened doors that they likely wouldn't have even thought to check. And he does this a lot. Throughout Scripture, there's this constant refrain of, now this is happening, God says, what are you going to do with it? He does this all throughout. I mean, we can pick dozens of examples, just a few. Joseph, you've been sold into slavery. What are you going to do with this? Moses, there's a bush on fire. What are you going to do about this? Gideon, I just cut your army down to almost nothing. What are you going to do about it? David, your son has assaulted your daughter. He needs discipline. What are you going to do about it? They don't always get it right. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the king who you have a personal relationship with, has just announced that everyone needs to bow down and pray to a golden statue of him. What are you going to do about it? It happens throughout this journey. There's no synagogue. What are you going to do about it, Paul? There's a demon-possessed girl. What are you going to do about it? Now you're beaten and in prison. What are you going to do about it? Later on in the mission, Paul, you are now alone for the first time on a mission in Athens and Corinth. What are you going to do about it? See, because circumstances are changing all the time, and we still have this question today. All right? Currently, this church is without a pastor, and in his last address, our former pastor challenged us to revisit some of our commitments. And we are going to have a meeting, as was announced earlier, later this month, where we are asked, what are we going to do about that challenge? My last sermon that I gave while we were still fully virtual talked about how shaking up our routines gave us time to reflect on what really matters to us as Christians and us as a church. And what are we going to do about it? As Johnny pointed out, there was a march in Fitchburg this week. There were demonstrations in Ashby and Lemonster and Gardner and ev all over the country. People in our neighborhoods, they are hurting, they are scared, they are angry, they're mourning, they're looking for change, they're looking for hope, they're looking for solidarity because people are dying out there. What are we going to do about it? There may be circumstances in your life personally that I don't know about that are changing. And you, as an individual, are being asked, what are you going to do about it? And what Paul and Silas did about it is that they followed the leading of the Holy Spirit and they looked for ways to bring God glory in these changing circumstances. And in doing that, they saw great fruit come out of circumstances that they could not have foreseen. They let God use them in ways that for them were new and probably uncomfortable. At least the prison was definitely uncomfortable. And through that, God did amazing things. They gave up their plans and their systems, and they followed God's leading. And the question is, do we dare to do the same thing? Point four is, the, our opposition doesn't really change. The things that they were facing didn't really change much. And, and you may notice this throughout Scripture. God always has a new way of doing the same thing or even a brand new thing. He's always got some way around. He's always got some way through. He's always got something in place that is going to enable his work to go forward. And the uh, opposition that they're facing is always basically the same. God's enemies have a limited playbook. Half the time it's a pit. It's always a pit. Throw them in a pit, let them starve in a pit. Let the animal get eaten in a pit. Oh, this pit's got fire in it. Oh, this is a conceptual pit of despair. See, it's very easy to disrupt someone when they only have one trick, all right? Our enemy only really has one trick. It is so easy to disrupt someone who only has one trick. It is so easy that you can do it even if you're bad at it. It is so easy that I have done it at basketball. All right? I don't know if you'd be don't I don't know if you know this, but I am not good at basketball, right? I'm not terrible. I just don't understand things like wanting to run or the rules. And but somehow in my teens, I end up 
as my brother's partner in this pickup game against people who were very skilled basketballers, if, if that's what you call them, and were used to playing against very skilled people at basketball. And one of them had this move where he was just hands everywhere. Right? He was bouncing the ball all over the place. I was later informed that the objective was if you're the type of person who actually plays basketball, you're following the ball and you get lost and confused and tripped up and then he gets past you. But I am profoundly lazy and he wasn't moving. So I just stood there. And when he was done doing whatever it was he was doing and he went to run past me, I just grabbed the ball. Because he wasn't prepared for somebody that wasn't following what he was doing. He was prepared for the type of person that he was used to dealing with. I then promptly missed a shot at the basket, but you know, that's, that's whatever. The point is, if your enemy only really has one big move you can protect, and you can protect against that move, they're powerless. Which is part of the reason that the church doesn't have just one move. Much of what happens in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea is old hat for Paul. They get rejected by Jewish leaders. Some of those people follow them from town to town. Apparently they didn't have anything better to do. When things get too hot in the city, the people send Paul away. These, this was cyclical. This was a thing that they were used to dealing with, this opposition that kept not changing. And we know basically the challenges that we're going up against as a church in our community today. Because there are no new heresies. The devil has no new systems. Everything that is out there right now has been out there for a long time in some form or another. Sometimes it wears a new mask, but you can always kind of see it if you dig a bit. See, the devil, ultimately, he's going to try to steal, he's going to try to kill, and he's going to try to destroy. This is what we're told in Scripture. But we've got a God who says that our greatest treasure is somewhere where thieves cannot steal and moths cannot destroy. See, we've got a God who says that no one can be stolen out of his hand. We've got a God who can keep us from dying, like Daniel in the lion's den. But we also have a God who showed himself victorious over death, both in the raising of Lazarus and in his own resurrection. We've got a God who can create and sustain with just his word. We've got a God who says in the face of the destruction that I am making all things new. What challenge is this enemy to our God? What can our enemy do to the, our God that he cannot protect against or undo or turn to his advantage? What is it out there that we need to fear? If his entire playbook is to steal, kill, and destroy, and none of that is a threat to God... If we are with him, what threat is it to us? Look, I don't know what any of us individually or what this church are going to look like in a year or a decade or so forth, because we usually only get the next step. Paul and his group only really knew the next step. They knew Asia was closed. They knew Bithynia was closed. They didn't know they were going to Macedonia until they were at the port that goes to Macedonia. That's how it is sometimes. We just get the next step. And sometimes we're fortunate enough to have the big picture, but we have to find those steps out as we go anyway. Right? Like Acts opens with Jesus telling his disciples what the big plan is. The big plan is you're going to be witnesses in the whole world. But they didn't know when that power was coming to them. They didn't know what that next step, when they got that power, was going to be. They didn't know what it was going to look like to go out into the whole world. Look, I'm not faulting having a plan, but as James says in his letter, we hold our plans loose because we don't know what's coming. We have to be willing to let God change our plans. Right? Even when we get the big picture, look, last year I presented to this church and other people that I, my wife and I felt we were being called to go to Ireland. And we have people ask us a lot, what's going on with that? Are you still going to Ireland? And I tell them all the time, yeah, you know, that's, as far as I know, that's still the plan. Because I do believe that that's the plan that God has given us, but I only know the next step. The next step is for us to get a passport, incidentally. But after that, I don't know. Could be that we are able to start fundraising immediately. Could be that I have a decade of ministry somewhere in the States to prepare me. I have no idea, and I can't presume to know. God has called his church, this church, to change lives for his glory in Fitchburg. We know that that's the big picture. 
The question is, are we going to take the next step, whatever that is? See, because we can make plans, but do we trust God enough to change our plans? Do we trust Him enough to change our teams? Do we trust Him enough to change the people who are actually going to be doing the work? Do we trust Him enough to change our goals? Do we trust Him enough to change our destinations? Do we trust Him enough to change what we think the final product is going to look like? Do we trust Him enough to change our methods? Do we trust Him enough to see us through every work raised against us? Do we trust Him to get us through every enemy and obstacle and problem that we're going to face in His perfect and very creative and sometimes uncomfortable ways? Are we inflexible to the ways of the enemy, but fully malleable in the hands of God? Because Scripture repeatedly talks about God as a potter and us as clay, that God is going to mold us, that we need to allow Him to mold us and have full control over that molding process, and that includes our plans. So I'm going to encourage you, everyone here, this week, take some time in prayer, take some time in the Word, ask God what your next step is. Ask Him to prepare your heart to take that next step. And then whatever that next step is, do it. Now there are some people, maybe some in this room, maybe some on Facebook, where I can tell you right now what your next step is. See, because I don't know if you've noticed, but none of the problems I've raised today are reserved only for Christians, right? Everyone finds their plans falling apart from time to time. Everyone finds themselves facing the forces of theft and death and destruction at some point in their lives. And the question comes up for them, too. What are you going to do about it? For all of us, that question comes up. But for those of us who are alone facing that, for anyone here who is alone facing that, you know that the world is bigger than you are. That its core problem is sin, and sin is bigger than you can solve. That there is an enemy who is more powerful than you can defeat, and what are you going to do about it? If you, look, if you want this certainty of knowing that the situation is handled, if you want to be part of something that is victorious and unstoppable, a force larger than yourself, if you want to be on the side of the author of life, if you want deliverance from the sin and the trouble and the corruption of this world, then your next step is going to Christ. It's confessing your sin and your need for a Savior, submitting yourself to His rule and His authority to change your life. And if you do that, if you do that today, if you're taking that next step, please let us know so we can support you, so we can help you with it, so we can welcome you to this family. I don't know what your next step is after that, but I know that we want to be there for you when you take it. So all of us, this week, please, Lord, what is my next step? Please give me the boldness to take that step. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity that we've had to hear from your word, to learn uh, what it means to trust you as plans change. Ask that you move in our hearts this week, everyone who's listening to this, that you would stir in us the wisdom to know what you would have us do next and the strength to actually do that. Ask that you would move in this church and this community and all of our communities and around the nation and around the world, that you would be glorified as your people take the steps that you are calling us to take, Father. Move in our hearts and use us to draw people closer to you for your glory in your name's sake. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our benediction today comes from Philippians 4, 11 through 13, if you wouldn't mind standing, please. Philippians 4, 11 through 13, I'll be reading from the ESV. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. 
Sometimes we use that last sentence without always recognizing what he's actually talking about. But in his letter to the church in Philippi, the first church that Paul planted in his second journey, he reminds them that circumstances are not as powerful as the contentment and the power found in God. And let us be a people who are so confident as this, who are this confident in following Christ even as he changes our plans.